Welcome back. You're still watching Series of Next Trade Monday edition with me, Fred and Demuli. We now want to move this uh, discussion to what is happening to the judiciary, and uh, the judiciary now finds itself in unfamiliar territory, with the ruling party now accusing it, accusing the courts of working with NASA to derail the elections. What does such an accusation against an independent arm of government portend for this country? We'll be having this discussion here in studio with Michael Agwanda and Eunice Lumalas in a short while. These are our guests this morning. Good morning and Karibu sana. But before we even uh, start that discussion, uh, I'd like to link up with our reporters uh, in Kisumu and Eldoret. We have Loro Tiro in Kisumu and Joe Monyama on standby in Eldoret with an update on what is happening with the nurses and lecturers strikes. Let's start off with John Onyama. Very good morning to you, John. Uh, can you update us on the issue of these two industrial uh, uh, actions uh, by the lecturers and nurses? What is happening in Eldoret? Good morning in Dimuli and here in Eldoret, uh, Uasingishu County. The situation of nurses is still on and they are still striking. The, we, we've really checked into hospitals and uh, in Dimuli I can assure you the situation is totally pathetic and you will never want even to go near the hospitals. Moitijinga and Referral Hospital today it has ended 40 days since they started uh, this uh, nurses strike. And, uh, uh, in Dimuli, you remember Moi Teaching and Referral Hospital is the only major hospital here in this region where all referrals are referred to this hospital. But today, people are now going to private hospitals and even private health hospitals also are saying that they are overwhelmed with the patients that are going to seek medication in their facilities. Lecturer strike in Dimuli is still on, but uh, here in Eldoret, uh, Wasingishu County, it's not that much felt because uh, all, almost all public universities have uh, closed, they, are, they, have, they have closed. So there are so no much business going on since students are away at home, maybe preparing to go for voting for election 8th August this uh, next month. So lecturer strike, yes, is still there, but not really felt on the ground since students are not in school. So we are just waiting to see what will happen. In the Muli, in nursing strike, we are waiting to see this week where uh, almost eight counties are planning to come together. Nurses from eight counties are planning to come together in Eldoret and they have said they are coming to have a mega demonstration where they will be blocking all highways in this region so that the government can hear their cry. From my side in the Muli, I have no much. I can come back to your studio. Uh, thank you, John. John Wanyama there giving us an update on the Nurses' strike in Eldoret. And of course, we'll continue getting updates from that end with regard to that particular industrial action. Let's now link up with our reporter, uh, Laura Otieno uh, in Kisumu for a similar update. A very good morning, Laura. Uh, can you update us from the Lakeside City in as far as the Nurses' strike and the lecturer strike is concerned? Laura, if you can hear me, good morning. Kindly give us an update on the Nurses' strike from your end. Of course, the NASA strike has been on for the last 40 days. The lecturers also on strike. I think this is the second or third week. Uh, nothing much happening on that front. And uh, we're just getting an update on the situation in these various towns. Uh, John Wanyama saying the situation at the Moi Teaching and Referral Hospital is getting worse because nurses are uh, still away. Uh, Laura, if you can hear me, kindly update us on the nurses strike and the lecturer strike as well uh, in as far as Kisumu City is concerned. Yes, thank you very much and a very good morning to you back at the communication center and here in the county of Kisumu. The situation is uh, pretty much uh, on a standstill concerning the nurses strike and the lecturer strike. Of course, we were at the Masena University earlier last week and, and of course throughout the week and uh, the lecturers had actually downed their tools. If you remember, Fred, uh, the CS education, Fred Matiangi, had said that the CBA will be implemented in two phases, but the lecturers insist that un unless the CB is implemented in one phase, then they, should not, uh, they, sh they will not be resuming duty. And as of the nurses' strike, the situation is still dire in hospitals. Patients are being shunned away. Actually, there no, there's no nurse. At, ho at the hospitals and of course speaking to their officials uh, just this morning they said that they still insist that until their CBA is signed they will not be resuming duty so in public hospitals 
However, there are no patients in the wards because doctors say that they cannot offer their services without uh, the complementary services, which are the nursing services. And uh, the nurses are, are not on the streets today, as they have been doing uh, last week. Today they are, they are not in the hospitals and they are not in the streets. And as for the lecturer strike, we will be doing a spot check on branches of various public universities just to bring you the latest. But as of now, Masani University is at a standstill. There are no uh, services being offered by the lecturers. Back to you, Fred. Well, thank you, Laura Tieno, live from Kisumu County, Kisumu City, uh, to be exact, uh, with an update on the lecturer's strike. Uh, of course, uh, Maseno University being very close to that town. We'll be getting more updates from Laura during our subsequent bulletins. Let's now come back to studio, and my panel just got bigger. Joy Mdivo joins us. Uh, good morning, Joy Karibu Sana. Uh, we're still here with Michael Agwanda and Eunice Lumalas. We want to discuss this issue to do with the uh, Jubilee Party's attack on the judiciary. And before we even start uh, discussing, let's hear what the president and his deputy had to say about the judiciary yesterday during a rally in Kabartonjo. There is nobody who has not been aware that the election shall be on the 8th of August 2017. And I am saying, Kenyans are ready for that date. You change and mess with that date, we will not accept you denying the people of Kenya their constitutional right to elect their leaders. Is justice Maraga ready for elections on the 8th of August or is part of the games now being played by the characters in opposition who don't want an election on the 8th of August? We want simple answers because we want a peaceful country. I want to tell Justice Maranga, Namimi, I am an officer of the court. I am an advocate for 11 years in practice. Nataka ni muambie, he has to make a decision if he wants to run the country as the president of Kenya, Akuja Ombe Kura. He should not run the functions of the president or executive from the bench of judiciary. Yes, those are comments we want to discuss now. And we do have an advocate uh, of the High Court with us, uh, Eunice Lumalas. What uh, quick thoughts on this uh, when you see the Chief Justice being attacked from a political platform like that by individuals no less than the deputy president, a very senior member of parliament, uh, the president as well, uh, giving an indication that he's also not very happy with the judiciary. What th does that make you feel? First of all, I'd like to say I'm very disappointed with someone like uh, Kipchumba Mulkomen because as he, he is rightfully pointed out, he's uh, an officer of the court. And therefore, a statement um, like that is reckless. When you find uh, a decision has been made by a uh, a bench or a judge, the best place to ventilate it in terms of legally speaking is within the court, not in political rallies. Having said that, all of us when we look at the constitution, assuming this was the constitution of Kenya, what do we think? This is a document that secures our rights as Kenyans. All of us, I mean, NASA supporters, independent supporters, or ju Jubilee supporters, our rights are secured by that one document. But the only institution that will guarantee uh, those rights is an independent and virtuous judiciary. Meaning that we expect the judiciary not only to be independent, as again as the, the, a lot of, we can hear a lot of political winds blowing, it has to be independent of those winds and independent of each other, even as judges. And I think that's what we, we saw from uh, Justice Maranga's statement when he was in Mombasa. He, he merely said, let us respect the judiciary and the process there. So that we are also, as uh, IBC, we are careful not to misuse public resources, which is um, necessary for us as public officials not to misuse, because we give the court a free chance to independently arrive at a decision without influence. Yes. Yes. Michael Agwanda, your quick thoughts on that, because uh, I, I don't know what exactly uh, Jubilee expects. Uh, once you say you, 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 you make such statements, what exactly, to what end uh, do you think Jubilee, what kind of effect is Jubilee trying uh, to achieve? First of all, thanks, Fred. One of the things I want to say is when the president speaks, uh, it doesn't matter where he is, um, the whole country sneezes. And when the deputy president also speaks on the same issue, then it is even a serious matter that needs to be thought, you know, deeply about. When 
Senator Murkomen, who is believed to be the mouth, the mouth uh, uh, piece of uh, the deputy president, speaks and also on the same issue. And being an officer of the court, then we need to be worried. The question is, were well, these people are uh, just venting what perhaps they decided that they would want to speak about at a, at a, a, spe uh, a specific uh, point or place? I, I can say this. There are some independent institutions in this country that are very, very key to the movement of the country in the right direction. When you attack the court of laws and more so the officers of the bench, then you are attacking the credibility of that very court that is an arbitrator in this case. Now we're talking about an election that is coming up in the next few days. We're talking about less than 30 days now. now Remember that from both aisles of the divide, political parties, if ODM, I mean, and NASA will fail, I grieve, the best place that will, they will want to run to is the courts. If Jubilee will fail, I grieve after this election, it is the court. Now, if it's that the same, same court that you're saying perhaps is not looking forward to delivering an election, for your information, it is not the court to say when election will be there. It is the law. It is in the law that we will have an election on the 8th of August. It is the IBC that is conducting uh, that election. I don't know why they are saying that, uh, specifically quoting the president, that if they don't want an election to be done on the 8th of August. I really don't think that's what the court wants. What the courts have been doing is basically handling cases that have been taken to them by the clients of the respective um, you know, petitioners, and that is NASA in this case. I don't think their ruling were based on who brought it here and when it was brought here and from where it has come from. It was based on the law and at the best interest of the cases at that particular time. And therefore, I will say this, it is quite unfortunate that we are finding the president, the deputy president, and the court officer attacking uh, the independence of the judiciary. This should not be tolerated. And uh, do you think the accusations against the, C, uh, the, the, the Chief Justice and the Judiciary as a whole uh, by Jubilee is fair? Do you think these accusations are fair by any standard? Okay, first I think the use of the name Maraga is not against the Chief Justice in person but is euphemistic for the Judiciary as a whole. Because what we have seen, and uh, I have said this before, ever since we started this election process, the IEBC has been tangled in court cases. Every, at every turn, at every turn they have been challenged. From when it was Isaac Hassan still in charge of the IBC to this time, it has still been the same sort of situation. Last year, I remember, I, I think I gave you the statistics, that the budget for the IBC last year for legal fees was in excess of $4 billion, while the Attorney General's office received in total $4.8 billion. So when you compare and contrast, the IEBC is spending so much money in legal fees, so much time in court, that it looks sometimes as if the court is the one that is basically running the, the show rather than the IEBC. So to that extent, I think I join issue with the president to say that, look, this process, the IEBC ought to be independent. But the, the nature of our system is that if the court is moved, the court must make a decision. If a petition comes and they come with a case, the court must hear the matter and make a determination. So to, uh, to that extent, I find that it is a bit unfair because the courts don't sit and decide, by the way, this is the, the case that you're going to hear mm -hmm. and bring a matter before themselves. If somebody comes, the court will make a determination. However, the difference that we have with how the courts have conducted themselves this time and in previous times is that we have seen a situation where the courts have said, look, there's nothing called public interest that overrides the rule of law and mm -hmm. they have chosen to enforce the rule of law. Now, this is to the detriment in some, in some cases, you would say, is to the detriment of the progress that we're making towards August the 8th because the timelines are so strict. Now, one of the criticisms we must, as Kenyans, admit and we must own up to is that we gave ourselves a constitution that wanted to be statute and to be the ground norm rolled in one. Because I don't see why but, but, an election day... But can day we really blame the judiciary for, for that? Uh, isn't it a problem that we all share as Kenyans that, yes, we did this, we came up with this constitution, the judiciary has a role to implement this.
and that is the point I'm making. We gave ourselves a constitution that wanted to be statute and ground norm at the same time. So what we have ended up with is a constitution that has pre is very specific prescriptive items in it that to change would not be a simple wave of the hand or a simple sitting in parliament. It's an entire process. Given those timelines, given how strict things are, and given how much high stakes are vested in these elections, it would seem therefore that as people in charge the candidates, the IEBC, and even the political parties should be acting in the interest of Kenyans rather than some patriarchal, some, just some, some parochial interest of the candidates mm -hmm. being looked at. Let's look at it in its entirety. Do we want this pressure cooker environment within which even delivering a credible election becomes difficult because of the timelines that we are working with? So on that point, I join issue with the, with the government Say, look, even for the courts, let's say, look, we are here even after the elections. In case of anything, we'll uphold the rule of law. But at the same time, even those going to court, can they look at it in terms of the effect, the cause versus effect? At the end of the day, how are we serving Kenyans? Are we actually aiding in trying to deliver a credible election? Or it's unnecessary pressure on the arbiter, who's the court, and on the IEBC, who's the one supposed to conduct the elections independently? Yes. Uh, of course, uh, Nasser has been accused of uh, also uh, being uh, going to court quite often in as far as these elections are concerned. Uh, Eunice Lumas, do you get the feeling that uh, the courts have favored Nasser in any way, that uh, all this... Uh, uh, election related matters uh, the way the courts have ruled on them that uh, is actually favorable to one side brother Indimuli, thank you for your question what i can say right now is that uh, i'm shocked at uh, madame divo's comment that the courts have actually um, given voice or chance or room to parochial interests in court that is completely out of order uh, if you ask me um, what we have seen NASA and others doing going to court to try and ensure that uh, the process in arriving at the election is, um, is, is actually free, accountable and fair is actually within the law and when th that's why the, law ha the courts have upheld this over and over again. When you look at the court, its constitution, you'll see it's not tribal, it's applying the law as is. Now on the issue of uh, going to court over and over and over, I would say that um, I was very happy sometime back in 2013 when uh, Parliament passed a bill and it was very clear from the bill that an accounting officer that goes to court uh, where they have not uh, you know, exercised the duty to, you know, to, to resolve the dispute in ways other than within the court would be surcharged individually mm -hmm. if they go on spending public funds in a manner that is irresponsible and that is the danger we are seeing with IBC. Why am I saying this? It is not only through court that we can resolve a dispute such as this, particularly because of the timeline. I hope someone from IBC is following and knows that the constitution, which is a very good document I must say and it's to serve all of us, has provided a clear mechanism where we can resolve disputes outside the court system. When you look at article 159.2c you have other ways in which you can resolve disputes. Going to court to ventilate an issue is our right, and that is something that we have to thank God for, and the constitution that we gave ourselves. But having gone to court, there is nothing stopping the parties from coming together, and I think the, the judiciary is very aware of this, and saying, uh, right now, this matter is in court. Uh, what can we do about it? If I was I IBC, I would look into calling the stakeholders, because when you look at section 26, of the um, IBC Act. IBC is mandated to work within the constitution and other than that IBC is supposed to ensure public participation mm -hmm. okay, in arriving at uh, its decisions and involve stakeholders uh, in arriving at those decisions. That is in the law. So when it's calling the president and uh, I mean presidential candidates it should go ahead and even call stakeholders including the directors of Algorai company and sit down and resolve this dispute in a closed door meeting. It's possible because of the timelines. Mm -hmm. uh, and in my view, uh, that is within the law as well. And the courts are aware. So we don't have to go to court to, 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 to resolve that dispute. Once it has been filed, it, we, it's within the party's uh, mandate to withdraw and retreat and go under closed doors and resolve the dispute. 
Yes. And I think this is what we need to do right now. Yes. Michael, uh, what effect do you think uh, this casting of aspersions against the judiciary now, uh, potentially, what, what does it mean for us? Uh, what kind of problems do we, uh, could, could actually come from this? If we can't respect the courts of laws, then we are actually setting our path to a very, very detrimental time ahead of us. We are actually saying that we may not go to court if we are aggrieved. And for that reason, the question that I will ask is where else will we go to so that our issues are settled? I think the president, if Justice Maraga, for example, had made a public um, statement, and that was in regards to the cases that were still in court and the printing that are already started in Mombasa, and I think it is in the public domain, if the president and deputy president and Murkoman himself had an issue with that, they needed to write to the courts, they needed to write to chief justice and express their displeasure with the statement that was made, but not to go into a public rally rally and, and you know passionately, you know, you know, sort of speak to people as if he has no faith in the very court. I don't think that when this president spoke and the deputy president mentioned um, justice Maraga's name, I don't think they meant that he is in, in, interfering with the process of the election, the upcoming election. But perhaps they were not just happy with maybe the rulings that have taken place in the reason passed by NASA. And I can tell you, nobody denied um, Jubilee Party to be represented. In fact, I know there was a case just uh, you know a, a few weeks ago that they were not represented at all, and they said we don't want to be there because we'll be fine with the, any judgment that is done. When did it? Uh, you know, when did Jubilee Party suddenly realize that? Well, well, we should have been represented, and it seems like the judgment are in the favor of our opponent. They're the ones who took them to court, and they wanted judgment, and the courts delivered the judgment. And for that reason, I really I would be very careful. I, advi I will advise the, the deputy president, the vice president, the more comment of the day that will speak on about anything, and you know, just for the support and psychophancy, uh, to, to stop addressing the courts in that manner. If they have any issue and displeasure, they need to write to the courts, and the court will respond appropriately. And I think that's a respect we need to accord the independent institutions that are oversighting um, you know, the running of this country. Otherwise, we'll run into issues. And for uh, as I conclude on this matter, I think NASA is going to court because there are loopholes. There are loopholes in IBC that the, uh, the, the, the legal team is not uh, at IBC is perhaps not advising IBC properly and they seem to be going to court. And I think there's also a cartel in IBC. The more cases we have, perhaps the more we can pay these uh, lawyers and advocates, perhaps, uh, you know, you know th there's a cartel there that if we don't check, these billions that are being paid to some of the lawyers must be interrogated. How are they, is it an open tender for that reason? You know, there are issues there and I think they're enjoying to do that. But we have no time as uh, Madame Dibal said, we have no time these people must sit together, the presidential aspirant, and more so on these presidential ballot papers that is becoming contentious. They must agree and deliver to us the verdict before the end of the week so that we know who is going to print the ballot papers so that we are sure that the presidential ballot papers will be here on time. Yes. Uh, Joy, do you think that this kind of assault on the judiciary will continue because it appeared that uh, this is something they had discussed and said once we go on the campaign platform, this is the kind of uh, talking point that you're going to push? Okay, first, let me dispel some of the things that have uh, been leveled uh, against me. One thing that I, I must clarify is that the parochial interest is not by, vested by the courts, it's vested by those who keep going to court because if nothing is ever good enough and all the time everything needs to be challenged, Sometimes you have to ask yourself, what is the use of all this endless litigation as if we do not have a credible judiciary even after the elections in case of any eventuality? That is one. Secondly, we must understand that whenever legal fees are charged, it's because the, the Attorney General's chambers defends IEBC's matters, but it has limited capacity. So anything else that the IEBC is thrown at and they have to defend, they must employ advocates from outside to come and handle the matters. When the matters are protracted, go all the way up to the Supreme Court. Litigation is expensive. It's not anything that is cheap. And one thing that we need to remember is that even though there is 
the provision for alternative dispute resolution if a party has already gone to court IBC has no choice but to go to defend the matter in court they cannot again pull it out and say okay come we are pulling a round table and we're trying to do uh, this thing um, in another manner outside the court system when it is already in court they have no choice at that point but even moving forward, I like what I've seen with the IEBC this week. Because I want to meet presidential candidates today at 11. Tomorrow they have said that they want to receive memoranda from members of the public. On Wednesday they want to have a public uh, forum. At the same time they're also going to court and trying to do uh, the appeal on the matter. So they're trying to hedge all their bets at this point in time. Trying to sort this matter out. But coming to your question, Fred, this particular sort of onslaught, I think it was also Jubilee's way of trying to say, look, even we get fed up with things sometimes because over the last few days there have been a lot of criticism that the Jubilee side is always talking on behalf of IEBC but even they are in this process as players not as arbiters, not as the IEBC and so I think it was also a way of just showing look you are not running an election for the sake of one side only you're running an election for the sake of all Kenyans and with the president trying to insist that look this matter is going to happen on the 8th whether or not we like it so we might as well get on with it. But I like also the rebuttal from the NASA side that said, look, even we are ready for elections on the 8th. So in my opinion, what, na what the IBC is doing now is trying to comply with the court order, trying to keep within the timelines. And I hope even when the presidential candidates go there today, they'll have the presence of mind to keep the country first and to say, look, moving forward, we are happy with this. Please go ahead and do it. Because... With me, I understand the principle is trying to get public participation, but there are some things that are technical. Even if the public does participate, what value do they add? And the public participation is merely for, not merely, it is um, purely persuasive. The IEBC still has the final decision in the matter. So we might go ahead and have all this uh, engagement. And at the end of the day, if we're still ending up with Al Gurea, then what do we do then? We go back to court. So it has to end somewhere. Yes. A decision must be made for the sake of Kenyans and for the sake also of the politicians. They also need closure. But do you think that assault on the judiciary will continue? That yes, Jubilee could continue uh, just drumming up that accusation? It depends what happens today. Because if today we get out to the satisfactory matter and the appeal is dropped, and all the matters now sort of cease and uh, simmer down, there might be no need for any quote-unquote further attacks. Mm -hmm. But if now we end up and there's no resolution, and IBC go back and, like I said, IBC go back and pick Al Gurea, will we end up in court again? Then you might see this uh, same assault coming back again. But uh, Eunice Lumalas, when the president and the deputy president stand up on a platform and actually say something, it's not something that, cannot, uh, that uh, can be ignored by anyone. Do you think the judiciary or the judges, individual judges, could be affected by some of these public uh, statements made by senior politicians? Thank you very much. Uh, what I would like to say, uh, now that you raise that question, is that let's first of all dispense any notion that um, anyone would think that the election is not to be held on 8th of August. Uh, the only reason that the election may not be held on 8th of August so that we can, we can understand the context within which the president was speaking as a political pronouncement, maybe meant to sway a certain group of people as, um, as, as his followers, that is basically what it was. Because in terms of 8th of August, that is uh, a matter which we cannot say that the court is working with NASA to, to postpone. How? Wh what would be the basis of that? The only way election would not be held on 8th of August is where, where if the country is in a state of war, for example, or the presidential candidate or the deputy dies. Mm. And I think no one is uh, going to die. Uh, even in my church, we've been praying for the presidential candidates and their deputies, so they are going to be alive. So let's dispel any notions that anyone, the, the judiciary is working with NASA. That is a political statement meant to sway uh, probably Jubilee supporters. And why not? I mean, everybody is trying to sway their supporters and, and, and coming out strongly as an indisputable leader, as the president uh, did. But having, moving away from that, I think I am very worried when I see IBC uh, developing a pattern with respect to Al Gurai. Because you cannot say we are calling people to consult on this issue, everyone, stakeholders, as we should have done from the beginning, uh, and, and relevant uh, bodies to discuss on this issue, while at the same time you are appealing, you have to choose a forum. Okay? So when you are appealing and then calling me to discuss, what messages are you sending out? You are mm -hmm. confusing me. And therefore I can choose not to come to participate. Mm -hmm. You have to choose, I'm appealing, let's go to the Supreme Court, 
uh, and we have to, uh, uh, and and ventilate these issues, or come, let's decide how to go forward and what concessions we can make and agree. Mm -hmm. And that is what we need. And that's what I'm saying. And I want to dispel, uh, I've been practicing ADR as an arbitrator mediator for, for many years now. And I would like to tell Joy that the civil procedure ag allows any matter even having been uh, brought to court and uh, been um, in court to be removed right now with the new rules and be discussed out and agreed upon and uh, an agreement can be filed in court yes. to that uh, but, extent. But do you so see for me, I see... Sorry, I see the possibility of the president influencing yes. the judiciary by such pronouncements. So that when the Supreme Court will be sitting, for example, and we've had uh, some experiences with the Supreme Court in the past, they will have the president's pronouncements perhaps at the back of their mind and perhaps, you know, may feel pressured to act in a certain way. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is very dangerous. So the judiciary must understand that we as a country were plunged into confusion and war in 2007 because as rightly put by the co committee of experts in their report there was no way that the opposition could have gone to court because, because the judiciary at that time was uh, generally viewed as um, corrupt and, uh, and um, you know um, and, and in, uh, not independent and therefore we would choose the forum of the streets in 2007 than the judiciary yes. and I think that's what we need to have right now. We need to have that confidence, particularly because of the, the delays and incompetence in IBC, particularly with respect to this tender, uh, they are put us where we are. So we need to have somewhere we can go to for any party, whether Jubilee or NASA or independent candidates, to know that this would be an independent institution. They will hear me out yes. as an independent. So that, I'm very worried about that pronouncement. And if yes. we have to take the matter of the Supreme Court and you know, whether or not they can be influenced, that's another issue. Michael Agwanda, of course, this is not the first time that the judiciary or a particular judge is being attacked by Jubilee. Uh, of course, a few months back, uh, some members of the Jubilee party came out and uh, expressed displeasure at one particular member of the judiciary and uh, the rulings that this particular um, uh, judge had been giving that were, were not necessarily, did not necessarily go in their favor. Uh, do you think Jubilee has been fair to the judiciary in terms of allowing it to carry out its duties independently? You know, I'm surprised that Jubilee is having a lot of onslaught to the judiciary. And my question is, when is it going to stop? Remember that Jubilee is the government, is the executive, and Jubilee has a majority in parliament. Most of these judges, actually, some of them pass through Jubilee government to the position they're working in today. That means they're really qualified to sit in the bench and to make rulings. I don't think judges make rulings based on their guts and what is going to happen and what is not going to happen and maybe based on, on, on the political affiliation. Uh, I think judges make rulings strictly based on the law. And I don't think that Jubilee has no resources to hire lawyers to be able to appeal on those cases that NASA has won. And therefore the onslaught on the Court of Appeal is nonsensical in my view. Yeah. Instead they need to go straight ahead and appeal those cases and find themselves in court and see what the judgments are there. The room is still there. So why, even if you had a problem with the, uh, the High Court judge, you still have Court of Appeal and you have the Supreme Court you can go to. So the question of this judge not serving as well or not, and you know they've not plead, they've not plead to the court to say that we do not want this specific judge to hear our case. And for that reason, the case will probably be uh, taken to the Chief Justice and the Chief Justice will, in that case, uh, constitute another bench to look at that case. So I really think they've been unfair to the courts of justice and for that reason they need to stop because if they continue like this and they are the government we are going to lose hope and trust that we really need in the judiciary remember the uh, Supreme Court is where all uh, you know the presidential cases will be going to if there will be any and uh, we had a very tainted Supreme Court we had a case where a Supreme Court judge was literally uh, you know hound out of the office because he was involved in corruption we have cases where we're thinking in the last general election perhaps some judges Supreme Court judges were influenced and that is why the ruling was done in three minutes something that has never been seen in the whole world so what we are saying is this is a time we need to have faith from both political divides, we need to have faith in the 
our justice system and say regardless of how cases have been going on we really think that these people will be able to deliver by the way we also have a new uh, chief justice and for that reason we need to uh, really really put our faith in them because that's where we are going to end if there's a problem and I can tell you there will be many many problems after this election and we will be running to courts we don't yes. have to insult these people Joe Mdivo finally on this matter of course uh, the, the general feeling uh, within Jubilee believe is that the courts have not been fair to that particular side of the poli uh, to that side of the pol political divide do you think that feeling is justified uh, first and foremost oh, again let me start with rebuttals before I get into mm -hmm. your question uh, when we say that uh, the pronouncements would be likely to affect the outcome of court cases I think it's a bit foolhardy I've been a judicial officer myself and short of somebody coming to stand in chambers and hold a gun to your head these judges have got security of tenure and they enjoy a fair amount of goodwill amongst Kenyans. I don't see how political pronouncements in one rally are enough to have them quaking in their boots until they change their decision for the sake of political uh, parties. We have seen them displaying a lot of courage, making these decisions as are shown that they have a level of uh, judicial independence and that we have very good jurisprudence coming out of our courts now that you can rely on even in future. So I don't see one incident becoming what becomes the, the be all and end all of the judiciary independence in this matter. Secondly, what Jubilee is doing is what NASA did a few years, uh, a few months ago when they were talking about the decision on the, the constituency tallying. They also made pronouncements like if it doesn't go away, we are going to find other alternatives. So what is good for the goose is good for the gander as, as far as political party um, when you're on the campaign trail. Because that time you're playing to the gallery. You're not even talking to the judicial officers themselves. You're talking to your supporters. And so the, the, the pronouncements must be taken in that context. And mm -hmm. the seriousness given, given to in that context. The people who needed to hear it are the people who are at the rally. Not really the judges. And the other thing that I also need to point out is the way we have set up our system. The judiciary is an independent arm of government. It's not a department of the executive. So the executive can go about and talk about what they want until they're blue in the face. But if the rubber meets the road, we have judicial officers of strong metal who can be able to hold their own and make decisions moving forward. But whether or not uh, Jubilee is justified in feeling a bit, I mean, a few decisions have not gone their way. And I would imagine there are a few bruised egos and a few uh, people who are not feeling very happy with the way things have been going of late. And that frustration is coming out, I think, in, the, in their pronouncement. But is it justified? But it is justified in the sense that in our political, in our judicial system, it's adversarial. There is a winner and a loser, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. And when you're the loser, I mean, who likes losing? It's one of those things that leaves a bad taste in your mouth. Eventually, you're going to say, so oh, this thing, is it even legitimate? Is this even <laughs> good for me? So in that but it context, does not necessarily mean that the judiciary has not been neutral. I do not think so, because if you look at the reasoning of the cases that are coming out, Jurisprudentially, we are developing some very excellent cases. Like Judge Odunga, uh, when, he was, uh, when they were doing this judgment, this three-judge bench, there was an earlier decision where he had actually set out the parameters for public participation. And he has laid the basis very bare so that people are able to build on that. And that's what the IEBC do, is doing. They're trying to comply with the court order by having public participation and seeing if they can go on appeal. It's simply, it's a multi-bet. You want both, <laughs> whichever you, you, your, your luck comes through, that's what you want to happen. Yes. Because at the end of the day, if they choose one way and say, fine, we're going the appeal, the appeal takes another, what, two weeks? By the time a decision comes out and it's too late for them to salvage the situation, they might as well have been trying to comply on this other end that even if the worst comes the worst, you still have a way of delivering within the next 28 days, which okay. is what we want. 28 days we want a credible and a clean election. Now let's go to that, uh, that uh, discussion that you've just brought up, uh, the IEBC uh, appearing to reluctantly embark on this process of complying with last Friday's court ruling on procurement of presidential ballot papers. Uh, now the commission has today invited all presidential candidates to a consultative meeting on that matter. Chairman Chibukati, however, insists the commission will appeal uh, the ruling which obligates the electoral agency to ensure public participation in the procurement process. Now, uh, the same argument you're saying, they're complying on one hand and appealing the decision on the other, but they could argue that if at all they do not appeal this uh, uh, particular decision and uh, the ruling stands, then probably that would be room for other procurement processes that have already uh, taken place to be challenged on that particular premise. Don't you think, Eunice? 
that uh, probably even the uh, procurement of the Kim's uh, gadgets, for example, could be challenged uh, on the premise that probably there was not enough public consultation. Let me start by saying that you and I, if we haven't in the past been interested in following how our hard earned, I mean, it's very painful to pay taxes at the end of the day. So we must, as a country, consciously follow out how, 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 how our taxes are being paid. Now, when you look at the Public Procurement Act, the act is very clear as to which is the preferred mode of tendering by public institutions, which is open tenders. Open tenders, we are inviting open competition, we are inviting more accountability, we are inviting lesser prices, mm -hmm. we are inviting a good atmosphere within which to ensure that our hard earned taxes are used properly. Now when we are going for direct procurement, and when you look at this decision uh, rendered last Friday by the Court of Appeal, you will find that actually there is a finding into the, the um, ineptitudeness of IBC in moving the process. You know, after the court ruling in April, uh, the, the IBC tactfully or no, not tactfully, I don't want to accuse them because I'm not in their shoes, um, you know, we re really, really need IBC to be wise at this time. They you know, they, they cannot explain the delay in waiting to make the direct procurement to the same company, Algurai. That's why I'm saying they, they have established a pattern with respect to Algurai that raises more circumstantial suspicion than anything. So that when you look at the time that they have wasted in not moving with the open tenders, for example, which is the preferred mode of um, procurement and going for direct tender when they did, so that they can say, okay, there's an emergency there is an urgency because we don't want, we want to do this with this company because of ABCD at this time. Someone will ask, were you prudent in ensuring we are getting the best value for money in terms of this tender? And if the answer to that question is no, then we are inviting probably another uh, legal suit by anyone, including yourself in Dimuli. Mm -hmm. You can go to court and say, my money has not been used uh, prudently by IBC in terms of this tender, and therefore I wish that each of these commissioners should directly pay for any losses we've had. And pu public participation as prescribed by the courts, that is the perfect remedy? Public participation is not just prescribed by the courts, but when you look at our entire constitution, the main thing, if someone asks you what is the thing that leaves your mind when you look at the new constitution, is devolution. Mm -hmm. One of the, the reasons why we had devolution is to encourage public participation. One of our values under Article 10 is public participation. And it's very clear, even under Article 10, that any public institution or body or individual must ensure uh, public um, interest issues have mm -hmm. been subjected to public participation, for example, like this public tender. So it's there in the law. So they should have done this earlier on if they were prudent and I think they have a very good uh, and capable legal team to have advised them on what they should have done before the fact of procurement. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm saying there is the only, you know, courts are not the only solution in terms of uh, matters like this. And I'm telling IBC that they have an option to discuss in good faith, you know, on, at the table with all the parties, withdraw all the matters from court and agree on a way forward, which is what we want as Kenyans, and, uh, and, that's, and that's how it's supposed to be. You cannot be filing a case on one hand and calling uh, for consultative meetings on the other. You have to choose one first. Yes, sir. In my view, it is possible to have everyone and agree on a way forward and move forward. You, if, if you are seen to insist, to insist on a certain uh, adversarial uh, position, then you are raising more errors and more questions, and yes. we don't want that. Michael Aguana, do you agree that probably the IBC is wait wasting too much time uh, appealing this particular ruling? They should just go ahead and comply and move on. After all, it's 28 days to the elections, don't you think? You know, Fred, uh, what has been hitting IBC more than anything else is secrecy. Uh, this is a public office, and it, uh, it is an independent institution. But let me th tell you, everything that goes into IBC really needs to be out there. IBC waits until it is taken to court for them to uh, pre do a press release. IBC waits until um, you know, documents are needed f from them, until perhaps they are threatened that we'll move to court. That's when they say we can release this. You know, case in point is uh, registered voters that uh, they did not want to release. In fact, they categorically at one point said we will not release this document. Yet, this is a public document that every aspirant out there needs to have because 
winning election is about numbers and, and therefore why can't IBC be releasing information why can't they engage the public regularly on what is happening I think this is where the problem is with IBC they think that the information they have belongs to them and they can hold them as much as they want I think it would be prudent for IBC to go out there and constantly update people on what is happening I'll text say this, when you talk about public participation, it came about as a result of the authoritarian, authoritarian leadership of this country, where it was coming from the top and you'll be told what to do and they will supply how they will do it and implement it the way they want. The people were never involved. Our constitution starts with we the people. Remember that it is us who are supposed to initiate development program within our localities, within our communities. And if IBC really wants, wanted to do this public participation, they would have done it. And for, let, me, let me dispel what my uh, friend Joy was saying, that you know, it really doesn't amount to much to have a public participation. I can tell you, it has a lot to do with how, what people think in that society. It has a lot to do with the business people that may be involved there. When you do public participation, you're not just like, expecting your local villagers to come into it. In such a tendering process, you are actually expecting bilateral donors, you are expecting uh, foreign uh, countries, you are expecting uh, specialists in printing, you are expecting printing companies, and when they come and give you their views on how that tender needs to be handled, or that process needs to be handled, you can take that home. You, may, you might not necessarily implement what they are telling you, but with your own wisdom and the people that have been put there, you come up with a document that is also reflective of the people that this is going to influence. And I think that is what I, IBC did not do. And it doesn't matter whether they got it from court or not. They ought to have done it from way back. They don't have to run to court now. But now, I understand why they need to run to court and to appeal that very issue of public participation. Why? Because if they do not do it, it is very possible that so many people might go to court and look at every process that they've ever been through until now and challenge pu public participation. And for that reason, if that happens, then maybe you're not having an election in August, of the August, August 8th. And that cannot happen. For that reason, they want to block that. They want to get a definition, a clear court um, or, you know, definition of this public participation in regards to the tender that they were doing. But again, as Joya said very clearly, they will have their own public participation even though they're going to do their appeal. They will also ensure that they meet all these presidential aspirants and agree whether they want to change somebody else to print the ballot papers, they will do that. But and, 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 and the third one is they will also um, uh, invite other people. I mean, public just to look at what is happening. Yes, here. but I then the they right thing, the right this is still has to make uh, the, the final decision on who to award that tender. So, Joy, does it mean that uh, even after this public participation, even after meeting the presidential candidates, uh, IBC could still go ahead and award that tender again back to Al Gurai? It is quite possible because remember, we've already paid Al Gurai about what two in excess of two billion shillings for this printing. They're already printing for the other. Um, uh, other posts that are going to be vied for uh, electively and Algeria have had a relationship with the IEBC over the last four years they have been printing all our by election papers so it's not like it's a brand new farm it's a farm we've worked with in terms of capacity there are very few countries uh, there are very few farms that would rise up to the challenge of what Algeria does even in the tendering process I think about 10 uh, farms are the ones that tendered and after shortlisting we only ended up with about Four, I think, if I'm not wrong, if my, my numbers serve me correct. So it's not like we have all these printing firms that have got their capacity. For the, because remember, our ballot paper has got seven security features. Seven. Mm -hmm. So it's not something that you can give just any old firm, go ahead and print papers for us. Because we want certain things ingrained in the paper to make it uh, a legitimate document. So it's not easy to just go and cycle style and reproduce. Okay. Given that... Even with, uh, with uh, what Michael is saying, that other people will be able to come in and donors and partners, like I said, it is merely persuasive because the IEBC is one, independent, two, they are competent. And matters procurement are by nature secretive. In any firm, bring tenders, bring them in brown papers, seal them, drop them in the box, 
when you open them your, your people are there they see them being opened after that you don't know the process people retreat and come back and tell you who has won the tender so I don't think IBC was acting in malice they may have been acting thinking that this is something that we can handle and like you said they have procured very many other things without public participation so this is one of those things that we have even as a country have the discussion to what extent is public participation and the courts actually shied away on giving the prescription they said in the judgment you ought to have included more stakeholders for example mm -hmm. presidential aspirants but they said we are not going to tell you how you are supposed to have included them so the, there's this right now it's the ball in the air and that's why i think they have this multi bed scenario going on because mm -hmm. even they don't know exactly what that this part, public part, what should it look like yes. so it's uncharted territory for all of us Eunice do you think there's enough time to make a, 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 an open tender and, uh, for this uh, presidential ballot papers or will we uh, just go back to single sourcing uh, in which case yes IBC could just decide we reaward the tender once again after public participation to Al Gurai in the mole, I mean, I think we need to be clear as a Kenyan society and say we know ourselves right now. Because there's a, there's a possibility of destroying ourselves if we do not understand ourselves. You see, if I have a neighbor of mine who doesn't like my dog barking and making noise, and he's seen feeding my dog, or someone like him is seen feeding my dog, dressed like him that morning, and the dog dies at the end of the day, circumstantial evidence can make me conclude and others that he's to blame. This is the al saga okay you know last year or the year before there was a, I mean we've been in court maybe four times uh, the, 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 the common denominator has been agora tender I think it will be full hardy and in my view um, without any um, well, how can I say I have not, no, no ill intention but I think it will be very very dangerous uh, you know for us to assume or to think that we are not working on eggshells Elections are very emotive and as a country we need to pull together. If the issue here is al -Gurai and um, direct procurement has already, when you look at that uh, judgment, it's well reasoned, it's lengthy and they are saying go back and retender for, president, uh, for a presidential b ballot. In my honest view, I think IBC should take this very seriously and understand and see the bigger picture that the perception of the circumstances surrounding uh, Al Gurai are already dangerous enough for us to keep insisting. No matter whatever has happened in the backdrop, we can only assume, like uh, maybe Joy has said, oh, we have already given them how much. I don't know how much it has been given to them. She's talked about 2.5 billion. I do not know if they have that money. But what I can say for sure is, despite all of that, we need to come together, including Al Gurai, and discuss candidly and say the country is more bigger than attend to a specific institution mm -hmm. and the court has pointed us to that direction from february of this year until now so i think we should look elsewhere yes absolutely Al we must in my view give this tender and by the way the law under section 103 104 public, public procurement and this asset disposal act has put conditions under which direct procurement must be given and it shall not be given where direct uh, the, the, the procurement is meant to, to fight competition and that can easily be argued for this specific tender mm. so in my view whether or not they can give al -Gurai, in my view stay away from it because of the issue of perception and the issue of circumstantial evidence and all this um, bad energy from the court Michael Agwanda. let us withdraw court cases let us bring people to the table let us use wisdom let us not give this tender to al -Gurai and move forward on a clean plate give an independent institution Mike do you agree? agree? You know, I actually agree with her. What um, uh, I will add on that is that, look, we've had the issues with al -Gurai, and NASA has come out very clearly saying that al, al is in bed with Jubilee. And for that reason, they need to uh, look at somebody neutral in this case. My hope is when all these presidential aspirants sit together, they will agree on a firm. Well, I, I really don't think that money in this case, whether it is 2.5 billion, remember that all these other aspirants, their ballot papers are 60% done already. So what we are saying is even if 2.5 billion, which I know has been paid, which I know is not possible, when you give a tender to somebody, they, they, they are crunches on how money is paid. You can't pay the entire amount of money. And so the assumption that we've already paid 2.5 billion to al -Gurai is not factual. I believe they might have put a deposit, and a deposit will, will only be paid after 
that certain work has been done and finally you know however they agreed on this tender but what I'm saying that you cannot equate the rights of Kenyans uh, in, you know that, that, that if election is not done well then it will go that direction. You cannot equate it with money. How much is being stolen in this country every single year in terms of billions and billions? So we can't talk about 2.5 billion and say that's so much money. We can still get money and even if it's giving this presidential ballot paper that is the only contentious issue to a different palm, I believe there will be people out there that can say, look, we are ready to help you pay this money but ensure that every presidential aspirant agrees that this is a farm that is neutral to all of us and can deliver this vote. You see the question here is the fear that NASA is having and the other opposition parties that, that what about if they print more ballot papers will they be able to stash them will they be able to, to manipulate the numbers that are coming to this country well those fears are valid because Kenyans have seen such cases before and so if we go with what we've seen before that fear is valid and the only way to dispel that fear is to ensure that we do not give this printing of the presidential papers to uh, al Gurai and perhaps give it to somebody else we can still definitely go uh, um, you know, direct tendering process. Uh, if this, uh, you know, ask me Just give it to a different company. <laughs> yes. Joy, if, uh, do you want to add anything to that uh, just before yes. we go on a break? Yes, the judges addressed themselves the uh, claims against Al Gurea, and it is quite notable that the judges were categorical that they did not see what the connection or the perception was that the Jubilee administration or the government, forget about the Jubilee administration, the executive was actually in cahoots with Al Gurea. And the, the court actually made a point of, of uh, pointing out that whatever was being claimed to be circumstantial evidence was not only inadequate, it was not even admissible. Mm -hmm. So in that situation, I don't see that the problem is Al Gurea. Maybe NASA have a problem with Al Gurea, but in even the court's terms, they said they did not see any impropriety, they did not see the basis of that, and on that prayer, Actually, the, 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 that argument failed in court and has been arbitrated upon. In fact, it was Al Gurea's lawyers that tell them, by the way, so these guys for defamation because you are, they have cast them in bad light. And yet these are firm that prints even for the United Nations. They print for other countries. So it's, it's, it's not just Kenya that is their only business. They have business across the world. But that aside... As Kenyans, we need to come to a place where we understand. The moment you sign a contract with a firm and you tell them, do this work, what you have agreed, you're going to have to pay them eventually. Mm -hmm. Even if you've paid a deposit now, by the end of the day, remember what happened with Anglo leasing? We went to court. By the end of the day, even if they Still delivered air, pay. we had to pay those firms because we put our pen to paper. We've already done that with Al -Gurea. So even if we go ahead and award another farm, then it's going to c cost Kenyans double. And okay. remember, there is a possibility of having a runoff if it comes to that. There might be a runoff. When the runoff comes as well, that's an extra expense. So all these Kenyans have to pay for and have to pay for from somewhere. So you feel we should so probably just reconsider Al -Gurea? No, it, that's what I'm saying. All I'm saying is even if it ends up with Al Gurea, is, is our least expensive option if mm -hmm. we end up with Al And it's one of those uh, firms that is already quote unquote seized of the matter. Okay. So for them, logistically, it will just be a matter of be let's easier. keep rolling. But okay. if we get a brand new firm, finding do they have what it takes, do they have enough uh, capacity, it, it might be a nightmare situation at okay. the end of the day. Thank you so much, Joim Devo, uh, Michael Aguanda, and Eunice Lumalas, uh, helping us understand what exactly the IEBC and the judiciary are going through. Uh, remember, those two uh, institutions are deep uh, in the heart of this electoral process. Uh, Jubilee accusing uh, the judiciary of favoring one side or working with their competitors to, uh, uh, in de derailing the electoral process. IEBC, meanwhile, is reluctantly trying to comply with a court ruling uh, given last Friday with regard to procurement of presidential ballot papers. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, for that, uh, for your considered opinions. Uh, just before we go on a break, uh, let's head back to KICC, where the State Department for Trade is launching crucial policy documents uh, ahead of the Kenya Trade Week. Let's listen in as Chris Kipto, that's a PS in that department, is speaking. Then the last one is Rwanda which is one, one country we also have a, a surplus, a trade, trade surplus. But we're working hard, and you can see the red line. They're also picking up in terms of their imports, their exports to us. I thought I should also mention on three others, Germany, next slide. Germany, which is, you can see, is an important country we trade with. Of course, uh, we import more from them than we sell. 
and then China, no India, you can see that it's also increasing and our exports to them is declining so we, we were to have a, a joint trade committee this June uh, but somehow it didn't happen we are optimistic in September we will have the Minister for Trade for India joining us coming uh, to Kenya we discuss matters trade and our president was there uh, recently in uh, India and we had good discussions so we are hopeful that uh, something will happen in our exports to India similar to China also there has been a lot of engagement with China and although there is a lot that